because in this lecture i'm digressing from our normal flow of lectures that follow razavi's book i'm jumping to the chapter on frequency response only for this lecture so this lecture i will introduce frequency response uh, and in fact start with capacitors and mosfet capacitors and circuit uh, circuit equivalence of mosfet capacitors and then do one frequency response of one circuit which you will be designing in the second assignment and that assignment you are going to do in the next one and a half weeks and that is why i am jumping ahead and then from next lecture we'll come back to our normal flow so let us begin with the very basics capacitances so until now all the small signal analyses we did we had quietly ignored capacitors now let us ask ourselves under what conditions is it okay to ignore capacitances so shall we say that we can ignore capacitances when they are small or shall we say when they are large or shall we say we can ignore them at low frequencies or shall we ignore them at high frequencies and in fact what do we mean by ignore do we mean that capacitors act like short open circuits when we ignore them or do we mean that they act like short circuits and therefore we can ignore them so you please pause and kind of think about these questions and maybe write down your answers before continuing this is nice fundamental important concepts that uh, circuit designers must be familiar with all right now we know of course that the magnitude of a capacitive impedance is 1 over omega c and therefore at low omega the capacitive impedance is large and at high omega the capacitive impedance is small so now let us ask a different question so when can we ignore a large impedance and the answer is we can ignore a large impedance when it is in parallel with a smaller impedance all right that is the only place where we can ignore a large impedance and what about a small impedance we can ignore a small impedance when it is in series with a larger impedance so we can say well that small impedance acts as a short circuit compared to the other impedances that are in series <coughs> excuse me and a large impedance in parallel with a smaller impedance can be treated as an open circuit so these answer the quest some questions on the previous slide okay let's look at the actual capacitances that occur in an amplifier so this is a common emitter amplifier you have all seen this amplifier before and i have included four capacitors here the the coupling capacitor cb the bypass capacitor ce and the bipolar transistor capacitor c pi between base emitter and c mu between base and collector so we say that cb is a series capacitor and it can be ignored at high frequencies when the impedance of cb becomes small so at high frequencies we treat cb as a short circuit because it is in series with in fact the input impedance of the rest of the circuit c pi and c mu are parallel impedances and so we say that at small frequencies the impedances of c pi and c mu are very large and therefore we can ignore them and treat them as open circuits all right so parallel impedances open circuit can be ignored series impedances when they become short circuit they can be ignored what about ce i am leaving it to you to think about all right is it it seems to be parallel but we what do we do with it all right think about it all right in fact now i am asking even a more basic question what is a capacitor a capacitor is something that occurs whenever there is charge all right in the whole universe whenever there is charge there is capacitance associated with that charge in a mosfet the mos capacitor the metal oxide semiconductor capacitor has charge across it and there are many different components of charge as we'll discuss just in a minute 
and there are the source body and drain body junctions which also have charges because all pn junctions have charges in them all right and each of the charges the each of the different charges causes a capacitance all right now when there is charge how do we define the capacitance mathematically for example uh, i think you know that a pn junction has a depletion layer charge so even at zero voltage and there is no voltage applied and even if the pn junction is short circuited to itself there is charge inside on the p side and the n side in the depletion region so then we cannot define capacitance as c equal to q by v because the voltage applied is zero so obviously c equal to q by v is not a universally applicable definition of capacitance the correct definition of capacitance is dq dv all right a change in charge for a small change in the voltage so whenever there is charge if we change the voltage across it slight delta or how much does the charge change and then that ratio delta q by delta v is defined as the capacitance all right a parallel plate capacitor is a linear capacitor and therefore dq by dv is a constant and it is written as c and because it's a constant it can be also written as q by v most capacitors encountered in semiconductor devices are not linear all right what do i mean by linearity a linear capacitor is one where the charge stored is a linear function of voltage if the charge is directly proportional to voltage then dq by dv is a constant but if the charge is a non linear function of voltage then dq by dv is itself a function of voltage and therefore the capacitance is a function of voltage all right so let us look at mosfet capacitance by the way i am assuming that you have already done this with professor madhav rao in the digital circuits course if not before definitely so what i am doing is a quick revision of what you have already studied and maybe in the process a, a few insights would emerge that you have not uh, seen before or as so these are the capacitors that we will be looking at there is the gate uh, inversion layer capacitors called cg there is the gate depletion layer capacitance called, which is called cd here uh, we will call this cgb so i have taken this from this website uh because it is a nice picture there is an is a capacitance called overlap capacitance that is a capacitance between the gate metal and the source region so this is source is heavily doped right so it always behaves like a metal so this capacitance although it is shown like that it is actually the capacitance in this uh, small region and this so this is like a parallel plate capacitor because the source is basically highly conductive and behaves like a metal so this is called the overlap capacitance because there is always an overlap between the gate uh, material and the source diffusion there is always an overlap all right that is a requirement of fabrication and similarly on the drain side there is symmetry so whatever is here is here also and there is the source substrate junction capacitance and the drain substrate junction capacitance so uh, one Two, three, four, five, six. All right. So let's look at each one of them. The overlap, as I said, these are basically parallel plate capacitances, and therefore they are constant capacitances. And so the simplest to visualize, and they are called CGS OV and CGD OV, and they are given by epsilon not epsilon. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. So there is. this capacitance is not epsilon s it is epsilon ox right it is the oxide it is across the oxide so it is the uh, epsilon oxylon of the oxide and then uh, into epsilon by d into the area the area of this capacitance is the width into the overlap length so let's go back so this this length is the lov and w is of course the third dimension right the coming out of the 
plane of this big figure uh, the width of the MOSFET so W of course will vary from one transistor to another and therefore the overlap in fact all capacitances are evidently functions of W and they will all vary as the width of the MOSFET varies all right overlap then let's look at a PN junction capacitance the you may have seen this if you haven't this is just an expression don't worry about remembering or understand even understanding this expression I'm just showing it to you we'll really never use it in this course again uh, but one should know these things uh, for background so the pn junction a one dimensional pn junction which is one sided and which is a step junction has this capacitance cj the j for junction is epsilon not epsilon s so this is a dielectric relative permittivity of silicon divided by the depletion layer uh, width or thickness of the pn junction into the area of the junction uh, and so that uh, and that x depletion if we expand it out then we get this expression so q epsilon naught epsilon s and then is the uh, okay let me talk a bit about so one sided means uh, one sided pn junction is a junction in which one side is much more heavily doped than the other side so the source body and the so drain body junction capacitances for an n mos have the source and drain very heavily doped and comparatively the body is lightly doped and this na the doping that appears here is the doping of the lightly doped side so for the source body and drain body this is the acceptor and density in the body uh, VBI is the built-in voltage of the junction. V is the externally applied voltage. So either the source body voltage or the drain body voltage. And here it is assumed to be negative. When this is negative, this will be positive. Otherwise, this will be negative. And A is the area. So what we see is that CJ is a function of the doping density. All right. So if the doping density changes, CJ, the junction capacitance changes. By the way, this is a step junction in that one assumes that the doping density from the P side to the N side changes abruptly at the junction from fully donor to fully acceptor. That's called a step junction. For step junctions, the depletion layer width is a square root. Uh, if it is a, not a step junction, the power, so this is a half power of half, that power changes to some other quantity one third or one fourth or whatever depending on the kind of junction anyway as i said all this is extra curricular information now it turns out that in a mosfet the doping density in the body so i've shown one part of the body so this is the source so this is the surface of silicon uh, and if as we go down from the surface the acceptor ion density changes as one goes vertically down all right but the acceptor ion density is constant along any horizontal line or a, or a lateral line okay so what that means is okay so what that okay so what that means is that the capacitance of the region at the uh, uh, the this horizontal region uh, we'll have x will uh, we'll see a constant doping density uh, of the p side but this side of the junction will see a doping density that varies with the depth all right so capacitance the source and drain body capacitances in mosfets are divided into two parts the bottom plate capacitor which is called cj and the side wall capacitor which is called CSW. So this is the side wall of the junction. And so this is one capacitor and this is the other capacitor. The total source body capacitance is simply the sum of these two capacitors. Or right, I look at, let's look at each of them. So the bottom plate capacitor has the same expression as we just saw for a PN junction, where NA is the doping density on the bottom side of the junction uh yeah the 
this area of the bottom plate which is the area so that is this length multiplied by the w the width is called the source area or the drain area and it is designated as ad or as for drain and source in spice and so that area is basically lj times w and uh, the value of lj it is actually a process dependent quantity uh, lj is what is lj lj is this the junction length all right this length uh, and it is fixed for a for a any process it is fixed uh, it doesn't change even if the length of the mosfet changes lj does not change or maybe it does no it does okay uh, it actually does change so what we are going to do is we are going to use ad equal to hmm okay let, let me look it up i i, I will uh, I, I will put this value in the assignment it will be 1.25 into w the width of the mosfet into the length now whether this length is the actual length of the mosfet or a fixed quantity i have to look up i have now forgotten all right so i i'll correct this in the assignment that i'll upload all right so the side wall capacitance because as i said the doping density is a function of the vertical uh, depth which i am calling x the sidewall capacitance is calculated as the integral of this quantity over dx uh, multiplied by p which is a perimeter so you recall that the as capacitance is the square root quantity times the area now this area is written as some length dimension and dx and that dx is integrated over as p is the perimeter of the drain source body junction and then then so if we write if we write this integral as c s w l then c s w l is a capacitance per unit length so the unit length multiplied by another length gives us the total source uh, side wall capacitance of course p depends on w and p also depends on the junction length the lj and we'll treat this as five times I, and as I again this is whether this is ln or lj I'll let you know in the assignment statement plus wn this quantity the 5 ln actually is a function of the layout of the MOSFET and uh, we are not discussing layout so now not, I'm not explaining where this 5 comes from when you study layout especially of very wide transistors uh, you will uh, kind of understand better more than I will uh, when you actually do layout but for now we'll just use this and remember that this PD and PS so PS will have the same formula and uh, similarly ADS must be specified for each transistor on the transistor line in the in uh, spice so when you say M1 drain gate source source model length equal to something with epsilon something there itself you say ad equal to something pd equal to something ps equal to something and as equal to something all right it is absolutely essential that you include ad as pd ps otherwise spice will ignore these capacitances and then your simulation results will be uh, unrealistically optimistic all right uh, the next capacitance is a gate body capacitance the gate body capacitance is occurs when we have small gate voltage is applied uh, small so that there is no inversion layer formed and there is only a depletion layer in the silicon substrate and then if we up, if we change the gate voltage slightly then the depletion layer charge will increase and that delta vg divided by the delta charge will give us the gate body capacitance now once an inversion layer is formed a small change in the gate voltage will cause a change only in the inversion layer charge it will not cause any change in the depletion layer charge and therefore after strong inversion has begun the gate body capacitance becomes zero all right so cgb is zero in inversion and 
for us in designing analog circuits, all our transistors will always be on. They will have a strong inversion layer. Therefore, for all our analyses, we will assume CGB to be zero. All right. And the most important of all capacitors is, of course, the intrinsic uh, MOS capacitor in inversion, uh, the gate inversion layer charge capacitance. Now, here, here is a little, uh, it's a, uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon that occurs in MOSFET. So, we will discuss that. Uh, first of all, a capacitance is defined between two terminals. A capacitance by definition is a two terminal device. Why not three? Can we define or think of a three terminal capacitor? And if we can, how would we define it? You think about it okay it's a fascinating question for the mosfet of course the inversion layer is present just below the gate and when the gate voltage changes the inversion layer charge changes but where does that inversion layer charge come or go right if i increase the gate voltage the inversion layer charge increases so i'm increasing the number of electrons residing in the inversion layer they have to come from somewhere do they come from the source or do they come from the drain? Can they come from the body? Okay, why I'm saying why not from the body? So I'm saying they don't come from the body. So you think about why they don't come from the body. All right. Now, when a gate voltage changes, how much charge comes from the source and how much charge comes from the drain is a very fascinating and a beautiful study. All right, and that how much comes from where is called as charge partitioning charge gets partitioned some from the source some from the drain and there is a it's a it's been a research topic for a for at least uh, 40 years and the first important paper on this charge partitioning was written in 1980 so i've written the reference here in case any of you is interested in uh, studying how charge partitioning occurs we are of course not going to discuss this and as you may have seen in uh, with Professor Madhav Rao, for small drain to cell source voltages that is when the transistor is in deep triode the charge partitions equally. So for small changes in gate voltage uh, electrons come equally from the drain and source and so the the gate source and the gate drain capacitances are basically half half of the total uh, mass capacitance so the total mass capacitance is of course epsilon a by d epsilon not epsilon s wl is the area of the mosfet and t ox is the oxide thickness the i is for intrinsic uh, there is an intrinsic gate capacitance and the extrinsic gate capacitance the extrinsic is the overlap uh, which we already discussed so the total gate source capacitance is the sum of the intrinsic plus the overlap all right for large vds when the transistor is in saturation and the channel has pinched off the on the drain side then for small changes in the gate voltage no electrons enter or leave from the drain side there is a current flowing all right but this we are not talking about the current we are talking about a movement of charge into the uh, inversion layer that is uh, separate from the dc current that is flowing and this charge coming and going does not occur from the drain side once pinch off occurs and therefore the gate drain capacitance in saturation is zero it turns out that the gate source capacitance in saturation is two thirds of the capacitance and I'm not deriving this. I, maybe Professor Madhurav has, even if he hasn't, it's okay. We are just going to uh, take this value. So, and as I, as I just said, the total gate source capacitance is the intrinsic plus the overlap and similarly the gate drain capacitance. So, in saturation, the CGD is zero. And so the total CGD is simply the gate drain overlap capacitance, which is a small quantity. And it is fortunate that CGD is small in saturation because 
CGD becomes a Miller capacitance in common source amplifiers and it significantly affects frequency response as we will see when we actually study chapter 6. Alright, so these are all the MOSFET capacitances, uh, the gate drain, the gate source, the gate body, the source body and the drain body and as I said, we will uh, never encounter CGB for all our circuits, CGB will always be zero and if the source and body are tied together, CSB will also not appear in our circuit. All right. With this, now we let us look at uh, our the assignment that you are going to do uh, next week. The assignment is design of a common source amplifier. The, you are going to design this circuit. It is a simple common source amplifier. The input is applied at the gate of the PMOS, not the NMOS. And there are two capacitors, there is a load capacitance and then there is a compensation capacitance which uh, we will study in chapter 10 right now you are just going to put it without understanding why you are putting it just let it just be there uh, the values of these capacitors uh, will be unique to each one of you and they are specified in the assignment statement the specifications you have to meet in your design are that the voltage gain so vo by v in should be greater than 100 which is 40 db the sum of the overdrive voltages of the two transistors the nmos and the pmos the sum should be less than or equal to 0 0.35 volts the sum of the widths of the nmos and the pmos should be less than a quantity w total w total is also given to you in given individually for each one of you in the assignment statement so it is unique uh, the most important and where your creativity and your thinking will come in is that you have to design this circuit such that the minus 3 db frequency is the highest you can get for your given set of numbers all right so let's discuss this uh, for the next few minutes Alright, so the first thing of course we do is we analyze this circuit and now we do it for high frequency because we want to find the minus 3 dB frequency also along with the voltage gain of this amplifier. So what we do is uh, we'll draw a small signal circuit and we'll include all the MOSFET capacitances in the circuit alright and then analyze it. So here is the circuit so I'm sorry this is drawn by hand because I was kind of running short of time so this is much faster to draw all right so usually when you draw a high frequency circuit it is a good idea to draw the low frequency circuit first so this is a pmos input so this is the gm v in of the pm for the pmos the ro of the pmos and ro of the nmos and then we draw all the capacitance and of course there is the cc here and the cl here from the drain or the output node to ground is cl from the output node to the input node is CC and then the other capacitance. So this is the gate source capacitance of the PMOS CGSP from gate to ground. The gate drain of the PMOS from the gate to the drain. The drain body of the PMOS from the drain to ground. Body is grounded on AC grounded. So CDBP is from drain to ground the drain to body of the NMOS from the drain to ground gate to drain of the NMOS so this is drain the gate is the gate of the NMOS is at AC ground so CGD of the NMOS also appears between the output and ground all right so these are all the capacitances whatever is not there is not appearing so we have CGSP CG uh, CGDP, CG, CDBP, CDBN and CGDN we do not have CGSN uh, let's see why CGSN is not there CGS the gate is at AC ground the source is at AC ground so CGS of the NMOS doesn't appear and similarly the CSB of neither the NMOS or the PMOS appear in the small signal circuit all right now let's look at this circuit carefully the from the 
drain or the output to ground we have RON and ROP so RON and ROP will come in parallel from the drain to ground is CL CDB and CGD and CDBP CC I'm sorry that's all one two three four four capacitors from the output node to ground two capacitors between the output and the input CGSP is appearing between the input and ground and at the input is a voltage source and I assume you know that whenever there is anything connected directly between an in a voltage source an ideal voltage source and ground that thing doesn't affect the rest of the circuit so we can just basically ignore that capacitor all right so we'll not draw it if you have questions about this please ask me in class so we'll basically get one current source one resistance which is a parallel combination one capacitance from output to ground and one capacitance from the output to input so that is this simplified circuit gmpv in ro is ro and parallel rop c2 is four capacitances c1 is two capacitances all right so this becomes our circuit which is fortunately very simple and now we want to find v over v in and in fact the only unknown voltage is vo so we just need to write one kcl at this node so i'm going to, I'm going to say it aloud and then go to the next slide so that uh, kcl is vo by ro plus gmpv in plus sc2 vo plus sc1 into vo minus v in equal to zero so that is this equation so sc1 vo minus v in gmpv in vo by ro plus sc2 vo equal to zero now we multiply out by ro so that this denominator disappears and then we have vo on one side v in on the other and we'll get vo by v in if you kind of go through a couple of steps and the expression we get is minus gmp ro into 1 minus sc1 by gmp divided by 1 plus s c1 plus c2 ro now let's write this in this form which i am assuming you have seen minus a0 where a0 of course is the low frequency gain in fact we already know that the low frequency gain of this circuit is gm times ro1 parallel ro2 which is a0 uh, 1 minus s by z there is one zero in the circuit and 1 plus s by p the pole in the circuit all right so a0 is gmp ro and we have seen this before so that is 2 over vov of the p mos because that's the driver into lambda and plus lambda p so this is one of our design equations all right for designing the one of your design equations you are going to design this in the assignment uh, the pole frequency is uh, 1 by ro into c1 plus c2 and the pole frequency of course is the same as the minus 3 db frequency this is a single pole system and that is equal to 1 by ro into c1 plus c2 now let us look at this a little bit uh, because this is a very important quantity for your design because you have to maximize the minus 3 db frequency so ro is 1 over lambda id and ro is ro1 parallel ro2 so ro becomes id into lambda n plus lambda p c1 plus c2 are six capacitors which are here cc cl and all the other other four capacitors all right and then we expand out id so lambda n plus lambda t into id is mu p c ox by 2 wp by lp vo vp squared the overdrive of the p mos squared into 1 by all the capacitances and let us look at this cc plus cl those are given to us cgdp is because the mosfet is in saturation this is only the overlap capacitance so i am calling this cgdop times wp where this is per unit width all right cgdn also is only an overlap capacitance so i'm writing that as cgdon times wn then cdb p n cdb n the drain body for the p mos the drain body for the n mos and we, as we saw this has a bottom plate part and a sidewall part and this has a bottom plate and a sidewall so if we write this out 
we get CGA which is the bottom plate into the area of the bottom plate which is L sum junction width into the width of the PMOS side wall junction plus a width. Similarly for the NMOS, the width of the NMOS, the width of the NMOS again. Now if we combine all of these, the only things, things that are in the hands of the circuit designer, U in this big expression for C are WP and WN. Everything else is determined by process. All right. So we can combine all these capacitors and write this whole denominator as this expression, some constant C0, which you can evaluate from here, some constant CPW times WP and CNW times WN. All right. And then another constant here, K1 into 1 by LP VOVP squared. K1 is this lambda n plus lambda t b mu n c ox by 2. Yeah. And the WP, this WP I have put here. All right. So this is an expression for the omega minus 3 dB. This is the second design equation. This is the quantity, which means this is the quantity you have to maximize. All right. Now, if you look at this quantity, uh, if you want to maximize this, you want to make LP the minimum possible. You want to make WN the minimum possible because they are occurring only in the denominator. What about WP? Will increasing WP increase omega minus 3 dB or not? Okay, so this is one question you have to think about and figure out. Do you want high WP or low WP or is there a maxima that occurs or a minima that occurs for WP? That is part of your assignment. All right. You want VOVP also to be as large as possible for the omega minus 3 dB. All right. But of course, there is a trade off here. Uh, okay. Let me talk about the trade off. So let's go back. This is your gain expression. Now, as I said in my one of the lectures while designing, uh, you all a good place to start any amplifier design is with the gain equation. All right. Usually, in fact, the gain specification is also given. Hence, given to you. This has to be a hundred or uh, forty dB. So, the first thing you will do when you start your design, you will say, "Well, I need to make this." Uh, 100 so what should i put, uh, what should i have here and i given that you want the largest possible uh, 3 db bandwidth you have to figure out whether you want to make this 0.1 or 0.15 or 0.2 or whatever right that's one question you have to answer but whatever it is let us say 0.1 suppose this is 0.1 then we want lambda n plus lambda p equal to 2 divided by 0.1 and also divided by 100. So that is 20 by 100. So 0.2. So this will give, a, give you lambda n plus lambda p equal to 0.2. All right. So that is one thing you have to satisfy. Now that means that roughly speaking, lambda n and lambda p both need to be about 0.1. Not necessarily, roughly, you can make 1.5 and another 0 0.05, another, that's another thing you have to think about and see what will give you the maximum minus 3 dB frequency. But how would you choose lambdas? You go back to your assignment one table, that you had a big table of lambda as a function of length, as a function of the various voltages. From that, you say, okay, I want a 0.1 lambda or 0 0.09 or 0 0.08. Specifically, what is the length I will choose? All right. And this is how you will determine the lengths of the two transistors such that lambda n plus lambda p is of roughly 0 0.2. All right. Better to choose slightly less because once you go to spice, these numbers will not be exactly uh, accurate you are going to do some tweaking in spice also. But to begin with, so you choose your LN and LP from your first assignment table to meet this condition of lambda n plus lambda p. All right. Then you come here and we say, okay, 
I have some LP. There's really not much I can do because if I reduce LP, because I want a higher omega, if I reduce LP, my gain will go lower, which I can't afford. So LP are not going to have much control. Similarly, VOVP also, you want VOVP high, but if VOVP is high, the gain will become low. So you don't have too much control over VOVP. All right, what do you think about it? This is a square. This is not a square. So can you do some trade-off here? All right, that is, that is all the thinking you're going to do in your design. And you want to make WN, of course, the smallest possible. What is the impact of WN small? What is the impact of WN small? Let us look at the current equation. So these are the other two, uh, the other two conditions you have to meet. The sum of the overdrive voltages has to be less than its quantity. By the way, this comes from the output swing requirement. <coughs> so let us say you had made VOVP of 0.15 which means that VOV1 will have to be less than or equal to 0.2. All right, you can't make VOVN very much larger uh, or much smaller. What do we want? Now let me think. We want WN small so that omega is large. If WN is small, then for the same current to flow through the NMOS and the PMOS, if WN is small, VOVN has to be large, but VOVN has a limit. All right, it can't go uh, higher than what this condition requires. So these are the trade-offs you're going to work with, right? You want to make WN small, but it cannot be too small because ID has to be the same as IDP. You're going, WP, you have to see, you're going to make large or small. VOP, VOVP is not going to be very large to meet the gain requirement. All right, okay. Uh, I want to show you a couple of things in SPICE uh, to, so that you are ready to do the assignment. So let me open up a SPICE and I'll show you. So this is, I've written a simple uh, CMOS. Uh, okay, give me one second. Let me make the font higher so that you are able to see better. Okay. All right. So a few things about... Uh, the spice so the spice allows you to define parameters so dot param defines a parameter so let's say i define a parameter lp the length of the pmos and i have put it here as 180 nanometers 0.18 microns then i can use this lp in your in my p m2 which is the pmos so i can say l equal to lp which i have defined earlier and I can use that same LP multiple places, all right? So it becomes a variable. So that's a, a good convenience. Similarity W, etc., etc. Uh, what else? Okay, so I want to show you three things. Spice allows a dot OP analysis, all right? And so if I, so I'm doing a dot OP analysis here. So if I run this circuit, Spice shows me all the DC voltages in and currents in the circuit, but it does another thing. So let me close this. So once I do a dot OP, after that, if I go to view and open this file called Spice error log, there's actually not more than an error log. So by the way, just ignore all these things. What it gives you is it gives you all a lot of parameters for each transistor in the circuit and some of these are very useful perhaps you've already seen them so it tells you the gm it tells you the gds is 1 over ro uh, so this is for a specific uh, dc biases that are present and it will tell you all these charges all right uh, so in fact a good capacitance model in uh, for a mosfet is based on charges uh, they, they are called charged based models. So SPICE uses a charged based model and you want to look at two specific uh, quantities here corresponding to CDG and CDB. All right. So uh, let me tell you which those are. C, uh, DQD, this is DQD, DVGB that is cdg all right 
So this is the value of your CDG or my CDG for this specific circuit for the specific dimensions and all that. All right. And the, uh, so the CDG and what do I want? CDB. CDB is this one. DQBD VDB. This is uh, CD, CBD. All right. So I have written these two in the assignment. So you don't need to remember. But if you look at these two numbers, these will give you the capacitances for the widths that uh, we have, I have used. So if it is one micron, then this is the capacitance per un per micron of width. So if my width uh, eventually is 100 micron, then the capacitance will be 100 times this value. Of course, this will change with biases also. Uh, but I'm, I'm tell what I'm saying is that you can find the capacitances from this file. All right. That is one thing I wanted to tell you. The other thing I want to tell you is I have written some of this in the assignment statement. So, uh, so I am doing it now I'm doing a DC sweep. So I'm changing the input voltage and this is a PMOS. I'm changing from 2.6 to 0. Uh, so that the gate source source gate voltage is increasing uh, as a function of speed. And if we run, if we run it, uh, then if I plot V out, it will show me how the output voltage varies as the input voltage goes from 2.6 to 0. All right. Uh, so this is if you vary from 0 to 2.6, this will be a, a horizontal mirror image. Uh, anyway, so this is a transfer characteristic. Now the importance or usefulness of this is let me add some other uh, voltage one second. So let's say you add any other voltage and then you right click hover on this and do a right click and then you do the slope. So if you plot the slope of uh, what V out. If I plot the slope of V out is output voltage. The slope of the output voltage is the voltage gain. All right. So this plot directly gives me the voltage gain. So the, what is the voltage gain here? It is 2.4. All right. So I have deliberately put numbers such that you can look at these numbers and get ideas about how to get your gain to be 100. This gain is only 2.4. But what I'm illustrating is that what you're going to do is you're going to design the circuit on paper, decide, decide some lengths, decide some widths, decide some DC biases. Once you do that, you will write such a file that uh, you are seeing in front of you with the input voltage, the PMOS DC voltage, the NMOS DC voltage, the widths and the lengths, and then simulate. And then when you simulate, the first thing you should do is plot this uh, DC transfer characteristic. So you do a dot DC, vary the input voltage, plot the output, and then find the slope of the output. And this maximum slope should become 100. That is your first goal of your design. So you now, of course, this is two, so you'll vary your length and width and gate voltages and whatever you need to do, you do so that you get a gain of 100. Once you do that, then you will do uh, okay yeah once you so let me show you once when you get a gain of 100 you will uh, find the input dc voltage the 1.6812 volts that is the voltage at which let us say you got a gain 100 and this voltage needs to be very accurate i would say maybe four decimal places is good so it's a 1.6813, all right? So this is your, the DC voltage you want to apply at the gate of the PMOS. So that is my V in. So I, I what you need to do is, you need to put that value here, 1.68127, all right? So this is what you do. Once you have got a gain of 100, then you do an AC analysis. The AC analysis, as I've said before, basically SPICE draws a Bode plot, which is because that's what you want to do next. Once you've met your gain criterion, you want to see if your 
uh, frequency what is your frequency and then maximize that 3 db frequency you do a dot ac uh, and uh, then you don't need the derivatives anyway let me just close this so you run this and then plot the v out and this is a Bode plot uh, so the Bode plot is showing that the gain is flat and then it is of course reducing because this is there is a pole here all right so this again should be 40 db all right this is a check actually once you do dc you get 100 then you do ac the low frequency gain should be 40 db that's the first thing after that so you left click on this so it opens this window and then you say okay what is this gain it is for me it is 7.75 db 7.75 my minus 3 db frequency will be at 7.75 minus 3 so 4.75 so i'll move the cursor until i see a 4.75 here wherever that is somewhere here and this is my 3 db frequency 10.6 megahertz all right so that is a frequency you are looking for this is your minus 3 db by the way this is hertz the one i talked about in the like uh, slides was omega all right so the factor of 2 pi will be there uh, one more thing so when, for doing ac analysis what you are doing is the input the gate voltage of the pmos has a dc plus an ac so that is why you are putting this ac1 what this is telling spice is that apply a dc at the gate of the pmos plus an ac of 1 volt all right now if you make this 1 volt so let me show you so if i right click here and if i make this linear then the y axis becomes linear so what this is telling me is is the if the input has an amplitude of 1 volt then the output has an amplitude of whatever this value is 2.44 volts all right and therefore 2.44 divided by 1 is the voltage gain and then that gain appears directly in db when this uh, axis is uh, set to db by making this one whatever uh, number appears here is directly the voltage gain all right so for example suppose i was to make this 0 0.5 then this number will change because this number is simply the db equivalent of the output voltage for an input amplitude of 0 0.5 so how much is this now this is 7.7 uh, so if i run it now it has become less all right 1.77 so you keep this one always keep the ac one so that directly the body plot tells you the gain of the circuit that is one thing the other thing perhaps you wonder how can i make the amplitude of the ac signal one because that is a very large signal it is much much greater than vgs minus vt the overdrive or overdrive is probably 0.1 or 0.2 why is this okay to make it one the answer is when spice does ac analysis it is analyzing only the small signal circuit it forgets the mosfet it is replacing the mosfets with mosfet with its small signal equivalent and all it is analyzing is the small signal equivalent circuit and the small signal equivalent circuit is a linear circuit there is no limitation on the voltage in that in fact the output can be 100 volts because it is just a linear circuit all right so don't worry about this being one this is just relative it's a it's a, it's a linear circuit all right uh what else yeah that is all okay that is all i wanted to say so that is the end of this lecture